Company A, second U.S. So I'm right? not sure which which one it was, is. but they had fallen back to there too. Right. So those were the guys that the 15th Alabama was fighting all the way back to and up and over 15th Big Round Top. Yeah. Two what did I say? Two, 50th. I two did of their not companies. say 50th. I I don't know. Last <laughs> week I said that I don't cuss and that you you played it back and I well, did. So okay, maybe <laughs> tomorrow you play it back to me whether you said 50th or 50th. Maybe I, don't I care. said 50th. I don't know. You were listening to Addressing Gettysburg. <laughs> all right, are we ready? Yeah, let's do it. All right, here we go. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Ask a Gettysburg Guide number 21. We're at 21 now, and that's exciting, Bob. I mean, somebody had suggested that we should do it from a bar because it's our oh, 21st be uh, interesting. Ask a Gettysburg Guide. But uh, We get some real good answers then. Yeah, and so what happened was we decided, uh, well, we're going uh, to do it on Little Round Top, and so we'd rather be on Little Round Top than at a bar. And as you might hear in the background, it's raining. So we decided instead of going to Little Round Top, we're going to go to Getty's Bike Tours and uh, use the shelter there. So that's where we are today, Getty's Bike Tours. Thank you, Getty's Bike Tours. You are wonderful, and you were created by a genius. Um, okay, so uh, we've got, of course, <laughs> Bob. Who was that genius, man? <laughs> that was that me, was Bob. That was Matt Kelly. That was me. You first know it. started Getty's Bike Tours way back in 2005. Well, I said genius. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, we've got you, Bob. You're here with us today. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, Jim Pangburn is our special guest guide. Welcome back, Jim. Thank you. It's good to be back. Did you enjoy your pizza from Tommy's? Sure did. Always do. Did you have one of Katie's muffins? i uh, going to take it home with me. Okay, good. Because they're good. I had one because I can't resist. Um, and then Eric's sitting in with us as well. Um, so a couple of things. If you don't got... If Hi. You, what, oh, sorry. I wanted Eric to say hi or something. Oh, hey. How you uh, doing, Bob? <laughs> good. If you don't mind, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to remind you of a couple of things. Uh, our September uh, tour is uh, September 19th at 10 a.m. It's a two-part tour. Drive them out at daylight, and it's murder, but it's an order. And we'll explore the Union's effort to push the Confederate forces off their foothold on Lower Culp's Hill on the morning of July 3rd. Spangler's with, Hill. Mm -hmm, with particular focus on the fight of Maryland versus Maryland and the fight for what we call Party Field. Follow the steps of Lieutenant Colonel Charles Mudge and the 2nd Massachusetts along with the 27th Indiana as they charge across the open ground of Spangler's Meadow on the morning of July 3rd, 1863 as well. Make sure that you get out to September or October's tour. Those are the last two tours of the year. October's tour is going to have, um, oh, there's going to be a little bit more than just a tour. We're going to uh, do our monument cleanup, our adopt-a-position uh, cleanup. And we're going to have a little uh, entertainment in the evening. Um, I'm not going to say who just yet, but if you're a patron and you listen to today's upload, you already know who we're talking to about that. So, um, and there might be and there might be something else, but special. I don't want to say. Well, you're not going to reveal. I'm not going to say yet because I don't know the date yet. Okay. I don't have but anything final. It could final. have major implications for addressing. It might. It, it, it could. could, or it could totally backfire in our face. I could definitely do that too. Definitely. <laughs> so we'll see how that goes. How Watch much did you guys have to pay for that, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> not <kidding>. none. <laughs> That's the beauty. <laughs> no, I'm not running for president. Hell no. Uh, no, that's the beauty of uh, our fans is that uh, they do things. First of all, they all have very interesting careers. Doctors, lawyers, Indian chiefs, and publicists. And one of them is a publicist, and she made a few calls to some people. I'm not going to say who or where, but... Um, very big, cool. Big things, possibly. But uh, we're not going to talk about that yet. But we believe me, I will fans. let you all know. Once we know. We do have good fans. And I just want to say thank you to the number of fans that have hired me for tours this year. That's right. Because otherwise I'd be poor to this year. You got, Poorer. Well, and, and people who have uh, joined uh, Patreon, I mean, they've been very helpful. They're very willing to help out down here. Um, they don't want to see anything down here go away. Hmm. They don't want to see the guides go into the poorhouse. They don't want to see businesses go out of business. And they want to the hear this. monuments disappear. Well, people don't want to see that either. Yeah. Um, and no I think, Matt. Jim, I think you got a, a, a couple of people that uh, wanted to contact you, too, for tours, didn't you? I believe I remember sending you... Uh, yeah, at least one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I think every guy that we've had on there has had a request. Whether they've answered the request or not is another story. I don't know. Matt, maybe sometime we could uh, spend just a few minutes talking about the uh, central role the Guide Association played 
in raising the alarm about the bill that the House of Representatives passed a few weeks ago to take down the Confederate monument. Okay. Uh, do do we know who the House passed it? The Senate? No, no, no. Do we know who to talk to about that? Or oh, I can give you some oh, suggestions you of yeah. some guides oh. that uh, yeah, our, our our president and others. And yeah. that he might be willing to come. No, that would be great because I think I, I get a lot of people asking questions about that, and I don't. I'm not really following it. Mm-hmm. I fully expect that they're going to come down within the next two years. So. Yeah. Uh, don't I, raise I don't, an arm. I, yeah. I do I mean, not no, expect that. I have no reason to, mm-hmm. except for my lack of faith in anything right now. So. I think it would be interesting <laughs> to have a discussion on the whole propriety of them in the first place. Sure. And then once they're here, what to do with them. Sure. Because we have some really interesting perspectives. I know our executive producer has a, some, I thought, very insightful things about this. Yeah, so we, maybe we had future. a conversation about that a while ago. I know where it's good. <laughs> um, all right. Well, since you uh, since you uh, brought up our second, not our second lieutenant, our uh, executive producer, I have a couple of gifts here. And if you'll excuse me, I just want to indulge us for a moment here, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you don't mind. There's a couple of things. Eric, here, take this box. And uh, it's not that heavy. I just am holding a microphone oh at the God, same time. You're old and weak. <laughs> All right, now Eric is now opening this box. Um, what is the first thing that you have there, Eric? Uh, is looks this a like gift from Gettysburg to Eric? This is a gift. This is a gift from a listener to Eric. Oh, from a listener to Eric. All right. Ooh. Okay, Eric is now opening it. He's got a big smile on his face. He's very excited. Um, Eric, you can put the microphone down while you do that, so you have two hands. Yeah, that would have been nice. smart. Okay, now what is this? Nice. What is this, Eric, that you've got? Oh, it's, uh, well, I know it's from Mike Stretch, and it's one of his colorized prints of the 111th New York Monument. Now, Mike Stretch, he is a graphic designer. Show Jim. He's trying to look there. Uh, He's a graphic designer, and what he does there, Jim, is he takes a photograph, right? And then he goes into a computer, and he colorizes it. Wow. But look at the detail he puts. Look at that on the the knee, the dirt on the knee. Oh, my gosh. That's so cool. Right? Isn't that neat? It looks looks super awesome. It looks like a a painting or something, but it's actually a photograph. Yeah. Yeah, That's, that's it looks like a combination of two. Yeah. It's got the clarity of a photograph, but the... It's it's fantastic. It really is. So I have one yeah, of those hanging on my wall in my room, and right by my door. So every morning I go out and I look at it. I think it's the coolest thing. Yeah, I remember Mike bringing those up to uh, East Cemetery Hill when we met up with him that night. Those those are awesome. Yeah. He's so, got uh, one of the first Pennsylvania cavalry on his website, yes. too. Yeah. I know. That's another good one. I, honestly, like I want a monument, too. Yeah, it really is. It it's is. It's a great one to do. So uh, Mike the also has um, T-shirts that he makes. He's a graphic designer, and he makes these really great designs. He's reworking our logo, which drastically needs it. Yeah. I admit I'm not a logo maker, and I made that thing, and it's horrible. <laughs> and, um, and I will be the first to tell you that, and I'm surprised uh, people have been kind and haven't said anything, but uh, I, I admit it's terrible. But anyway, so Mike uh, has a website that he just launched. It's called Heritage Depot. It's heritage-depot.com. You can go and you can get these prints, these canvas prints um, uh, that uh, he just gave uh, Eric, among other things, as well as uh, really cool t-shirt designs. He told me like he just launched it like two weeks ago, and he's already done really well on sales. So Good for him, it's, he does, yeah. I, I he, like his stuff. He's got really nice stuff. Oh, I love his stuff. It's great. It's great stuff. Do you know so. what other ones he's done? Other other uh, monuments. As far as oh, yeah. these go, yeah. the, the only other one he's got on his website. Talking is to the, the mic, Eric. Is the uh, first PA Cavalry? Um, yeah, I think he's doing more, but I don't know he what ones. He told me, and I can't remember what other ones. That Do you know he if was, he has a connection with the hundred and eleventh? No, I think he just took the picture. Yeah. Okay. I think he's just going around. I told him he needs to do this with every statue that's on the battlefield. I think it's the coolest thing. It is. People one would of the, love it. It's one of the most realistic, nicest monuments on the yeah. battlefield. Um, sometimes I'll stop there first on a tour just to show kids what, if it's kids, what kind the, of accoutrements and things. The they soldier have. looks. Uh, he looks real. He doesn't look perfectly dressed. He, you know, doesn't mm-hmm. look by the book. He looks like a guy who's out in the field. That's what I like about it. Uh, all right, and then so uh, thank you, Mike, for that. Yes, and thank you very um, much, oh, Mike. oh, Eric, sorry. There's a second present in there oh, for you, and this oh is my. from me. Is and it my now birthday? tell everybody what it is. A dog training collar. <laughs> yes. Is this so I can put it on you and yes. zap you? <laughs> yes. So I, 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 I put up a uh, 
an episode on Patreon. It was just me. I think it was called The State of the Show or something like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. And my mother listened to it, and it was the first one that she had listened to, and she said, I listened to your show, and I have to say, I don't know how you, you weren't reading that? You just sit there and talk all that time without a script? I said, yeah. She goes, I don't know how you do it. You must get it from me, the gift of gab. And I said, yeah, maybe. I don't know. And she's like, well, listen, I wouldn't be a mother if I didn't have one critique. And I said, of course not. So I said, what is it? She goes, you say um too much. <laughs> I said, yeah, I know. This, it's a crutch that I have. It's plagued me all this time that I've been doing this, and I do I do say um too much. And when I had an old my my old podcast, we were trying to not curse on it, mm-hmm. and we got this idea to get these shock collars, and everybody wore one. And one of the members who who operated the video cameras, and and he really wasn't part of the show. He had all of our remote controls. You have and no idea how excited I am to I use this. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but no one on this broadcast ever curses. So oh, there man. we go. But oh. you have the job from ne- the next show on oh god to zap me every time i say um <laughs> or ah Just, um. how about uh, zap us when we do something <laughs> incorrect <laughs> we should send these oh, out to man. all the listeners no <laughs> oh. <laughs> that's too many zaps oh this is going to be super painful i need you to know that well like no, you're go- we're going to go over exactly how high you can turn it does well, he have the collar on is that why the bandana yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but no. here's the thing is i've got the remote <laughs> And this is where you... I know. Yeah. This is where I have to trust that you're oh, somewhat of a decent human being. But anyway, that's that's going to be the thing. Cause, and it works, <laughs> believe it or not. Like, it broke us of our cursing habit. Oh, uh, very sure. quickly, very quickly, uh, you learn. When you're about to do it, you go, oh, it makes you think <laughs> twice. So you're only going to have maybe at most a month worth of shows before that's I've fine. learned we my lesson. We can find other things to, to curb. <laughs> With that. <laughs> all right. Anyway, so uh, don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, that all the questions you're about to hear on Addressing Gettysburg's Ask a Gettysburg Guide are provided by our cadre of second lieutenants over at Patreon.com. So go to Patreon.com slash Addressing Gettysburg to become a patron. Today we're talking about Little Round Top. James Pangburn, um, why don't you give us, uh, you and Bob, uh, why don't you give us a little bit of a uh, background How do the armies meet on Little Round Top? Why? What's going on? It's part of a bigger action. What is that bigger action? When is it? All that stuff. Okay, it's on the second day, July 2nd, 1863, second day of the battle. Little Round Top is, uh, what is it, Bob, about 400 feet tall? I mean, it's on the southern end of the battlefield, about two miles south of Cemetery Hill. Yeah, I think above sea level, it's more like over 600, maybe 650. I think think it's something like that. Um, it's it, 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 people who are familiar with Gettysburg, even in a basic sense, know about the fish hook, and Little Round Top would be essentially the eye at the end of the shank. Big Round Top, technically south of Little Round Top, would be the eye of the shank. But it's it's the southern end of the, the shank. Uh, Cemetery Ridge travels two miles from Cemetery Hill south, and then it terminates pretty much on the Round Tops. Little Round Top being just a little bit north, a big Round Top, and that was supposed to be the far Union left on the second day, and the Confederates are trying to move south and get beyond the end of the Union line, which early in the day was about a mile north of Little Round Top in the area where the Pennsylvania Memorial is today. And then General Dan Sickles' Third Corps will arrive with about 10,000 men. And they're, they're ordered to connect with the rest of the Union line, Hancock's Corps, about where the Pennsylvania Memorial is today on Cemetery Ridge, and then extend the Union left uh, and anchor the, un- the southern anchor of the Union line on Little Round Top, which had been cleared on its western face this time of year, September, uh, nine months before the battle, September 1862. So um, it wasn't originally a, a target for the Confederates, and um, uh, it ended up being an area that they came through, and Union troops wound up there uh, at a critical moment because General Dan Sickles had left Little Round Top essentially unoccupied except for a few Signal Corps guys that were up there communicating on the 2nd. Okay, and so everybody knows about uh, the 20th Maine, of course, because of the movie and all this other stuff. But uh, the, the battle for Little Round Top involved far more than just the 20th Maine. Correct. Right. Uh, 20th Maine was part of Vincent's Brigade. Um, how does Vincent's Brigade come to Little Round Top? How is it that they actually get... They're part of the 5th Corps, and they're held in reserve. 
um, right in the middle of the Union Fish Hook, kind of along the Baltimore Pike. And uh, after Meade finds General Sickles has advanced his corps three-quarter mile to the front out to the Peach Orchard along the Emmitsburg Road, and only about 600 yards from the Confederate line, um, the Fifth Corps is sent to the Union left to back up Sickles. And at a critical moment, um, Vincent's brigade, which is really the only reg- or, or volunteers in this particular division of the Fifth Corps, they got uh, U.S. regulars um, in their division, and they're cruising up what we today know as the Wheatfield Road. They're going north, excuse me, they're going west toward the Peach Orchard, but they're crossing the northern edge, the lower part of Little Round Top, not far from where General Sedgwick's Equestrian Monument is today, okay. near Sykes Avenue. Okay. So, and then they're, they're stopped and brought up. Um, yeah, they're, they're basically headed up the Wheatfield Road to, to reinforce Sickles, mm-hmm. uh, who'd moved out to that exposed position. And, and Meade realized it was too late. Uh, the Confederates were getting ready to attack, and he really couldn't withdraw Sickles to his exposed position, so he sent for these reinforcements. And uh, about the time Sickles is meeting General Meade, the Union commander, Meade um, has his chief topographical engineer, General Governor Kimball Warren, head to Little Round Top to reconnoiter the Union left. And Warren gets up there just before the Confederates attack and finds the hill essentially vacant, except for these handful of Signal Corps guys. Mm-hmm. And right away, West Point graduate Warren understands the value of Little Round Top and uh, realizes he identifies where the Confederates are on Seminary Ridge. He realizes that ultimately the, the Union left at Devil's Den, about 600 yards due west of Little Round Top, is outflanked. And so he sends an urgent message down to the Wheatfield Road, because he sees all these Union troops heading out the Wheatfield Road toward the Peach Orchard, and Colonel um, Vincent intercepts a message. It's really intended for anybody, you know, right. of, of authority that can answer the message, and he demands his courier said, you know, give me the message. He's, he's just a he's just a colonel. He he should have been a brigadier general. Uh, they just had an act on. He's commanding a brigade, and Warren's basically basically saying, hey. This hill up over your left shoulder, which is pretty imposing from down on the Wheatfield Road, when you look back over your left shoulder, um, is about to be attacked from the south side. We don't have anybody up the hill. Help. All right. And so Vincent is in a really interesting situation. I think it has a lot of value today for people who are studying like leadership lessons and things like mm-hmm, that. Mm-hmm. What do you do? Your orders are to go out to the Peach Orchard and aid Sickles, but this West Point graduate, chief topographical engineer, saying, hey, I'll take the responsibility. You need to get up here. And uh, to Vincent's credit, uh, he uh, chooses to risk a court-martial and divert his men, um, a brigade of uh, about 1,300 men from Michigan, Maine, New York, and Pennsylvania, from the north side of Little Round Top to the south side, because the Confederates are attacking from the south. Okay. They're coming from over Big Round Top, essentially, and right. delves it in. And uh, so they get there. Now, in the meantime, the Confederates are coming. Um, who, who are, who's going to be opposing Vincent's brigade from the Confederate Army? Primarily, uh, initially, it's going to be um, Law's Brigade of Alabamians who are on the far Confederate right when they attack around 4.30 in the afternoon of the 2nd. Okay. Um, and now I've, I've heard before, I've heard between 5 and 15 minutes from when the uh, Vincent's Brigade gets onto Little Round Top before... Uh, what am I trying to say here? Before the arrival of <laughs> Law's you. Brigade and part yeah. of Robertson's Brigade, the 4th and the 5th Texas, fourth and fifth Texas kind of mingled right. in with... Robert. Yeah, because as they're all coming across, there's a big, uh, I want to say cluster F word, but I don't, <laughs> I don't want to say that. Uh, but there's a, big, <laughs> <laughs> there's a big, there's a big confusion. The the um, some of the regiments and brigades are getting mixed up. Where you know they're going onto the path of another brigade and going with them and stuff like that, right? Like, yeah, like you said, cluster. Yeah, uh, mainly around Devil's Den. Uh, you've got a number of brigades down there. You've got, like you said, Robertson's uh, Texans, and uh, you've got Benning's Georgians that'll come down through there, Anderson's guys as well. Uh, but on the far right, basically coming over Big Round Top and making the initial attack that, that Vincent basically sees the most of is, is um, Laws, Alabamans. Okay. Evangel So just in the nick of time, Vincent's brigade gets up there. Not too long afterwards, uh, the Confederates start coming down from Big Round Top. They're not coming down off of Big Round Top uh, unopposed, right? I mean, they they didn't get up to the top of Big Round Top unopposed. They uh, there were some skirmishers that they Burdan sharpshooters right okay. had skirmish like like typically you do before mm-hmm. a battle you have skirmishers out in front of the main body that are kind of slowing the enemy down and, and giving your guys behind you a chance to brace for the shock of combat. But they were further out like 
the, the, the slider farm, farm, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so they, they fought their way back yeah. and if, up if that hill. Our listeners hill. could picture themselves by that big witness tree at Devil's Den looking towards the Confederate line. About halfway out, you'll see a nice white fence mm-hmm. uh, just to the right of a stone house. That's where the slider family lived. And that's where the, the, the skirmish line where the Berdan sharpshooters companies were out there. And those are the units that are going to be, you correct me if I'm wrong, Jim, but those are the units that are going to be pushed out by the advance of, of Laws and Robertson's men. That's my understanding, Bob. And if it weren't, weren't them, I don't know who it would be. Right. So uh, when they get to the top, the 15th Alabama, not all of Laws' brigade, stops, right? The 15th yeah, Alabama. Yeah, the a big round time. Right. Yeah. And, Which and I've climbed up there, and I would too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's not after walking 24 miles. Exactly. Because after doing a marathon, essentially, yeah. in early July weather, yeah. you know. Hell no. No water. Right. You said. I had a bottle of water with me. Yep. So, yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's a crazy climb. Nobody ever talks about, you know, what those guys went through. No, I yeah. think we take, when we talk about anything, a lot of things uh, regarding the this battle or history in general, a lot of people take out the human element of things. Like, mm-hmm. you know, like Lee, supposedly sick. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a big factor. Sure. People say, well, why do you think Lee did all this? I'm thinking because he had diarrhea. Yeah. Like, you know. Exactly. Do you remember when you have diarrhea? Like, <laughs> do you feel like you're up to snuff? Because I don't. Exactly. People run up to you asking questions. <laughs> you're trying yeah. to go up behind your, your tent. <laughs> right. Yeah, it exactly. Was, it was I'm mentioned. worried where the outhouse is. This guy's asking me where to bring my troops. I don't exactly. care. It was, it was mentioned by, I think, one or two of you briefly, but it was well over 20 miles, 24, maybe 25 miles yeah. that they had as much as 27. Yeah. I always say a marathon. Right. 26.2. So pretty they're, close. they're on the other side of South Mountain. They're closer to Chambersburg. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And they have to climb South Mountain. I think they began their march like 3 o'clock, 3.30 <laughs> two, in the morning. 2, 3 in the morning, yeah. Yeah. yeah now, that's that another nice one. Cool. It's only like 84. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> that's another thing, too, is that just driving that route. Yeah. My, I got to stop and take a breath on behalf of my car <laughs> when I get to the top of that On a hill. paved road. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so to put this as a context, I think I might have mentioned this on an earlier podcast, but we had a guy named Dave Weaver. He's still a guide. I know but the Dave name. was a young man. Were you around when Dave walked it? Just I heard about s- that. I heard he, uh, Jim Klaus was like. with him. Oh, I didn't know I that. Jim Klaus. Yeah, he, Jim he Klaus did that was another too. guy. Yeah, they actually guy. walked. I heard about I, that. I, I miss Jim. But I Dave was in good shape. Um, he had water. He uh, yeah. He was a young man. He had served uh, in the military, although it might have been reserves. I'm not sure. Yeah. But uh, he, he was pretty exhausted by the time it was over, as yeah. I recall. Yeah, I would love to do something like that. Oh, yeah. On, on horseback. Bicycle, yeah. yeah, in December, no, on horseback. maybe. <laughs> yeah, December, right. <laughs> you would, yeah, you yeah. wouldn't even do it on a bicycle. No, no, no. Well, electric. Or, or it was a tandem and I was doing all the. <laughs> <laughs> One of those little uh, trailers that we have for the kids. Yeah, yeah. And that's the kind of guy whose legs would be dragging behind, <laughs> making extra work for me. <laughs> no, well, I've been trying to push. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, battle is engaged now. Uh, of course, Chamberlain gets all the, the credit and the attention, but there's the 83rd Pennsylvania. Right. That's to uh, their right. Chamberlain's boss, his brigade commander's old unit. And at first, to, when to their right, right. When when um, uh, the the Alabamians are attacking, at first they're focusing on the eighty third, isn't that right? And then the twentieth Maine is kind of flanking them, or is that just the forty seventh Alabama? Uh, the way I understand it, well, the, the entire brigade is basically coming across what is today Warren Avenue. Which is the road that kind of separates Little Round Top from the Dick entire whose right. brigade? Uh, Law's Law, brigade. Law. And and you had mentioned the Fifteenth Al- uh, Alabama Colonel Oates. They're on the extreme right, right. And they do go up to the top, a big round top. And the story is that uh, Oates, the colonel of the unit, gets up there and sends a message back to his brigade commander, Law. This is a Gibraltar. Mm-hmm. We could hold it indefinitely if you'll send us artillery. <laughs> and the message comes back and says. Uh, well, your orders weren't to hold, but to attack. Right. And if we sent you artillery, you'd have to cut the trees down right. to use them. So please just follow your just orders go. and make the attack. <laughs> I always thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. So, so at first, then um, there's I get I get the sense, and maybe I'm wrong on this, but I get the sense that uh, the 15th Alabama is kind of feeling around blind at first until they are engaged. They, they're arriving later. They're arriving later. Yeah, the 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 center of the brigade would yeah. be 
Okay, so from left to right, since most people know the 20th Main. The 20th mm -hmm. Main is on the left of the brigade, and then the 83rd Pennsylvania, and the juncture would be about where the modern road is that goes up to the top, a little round top. Right. Next to them would be the 44th New York. The mm -hmm. 44th was originally supposed to be on the right, but uh, Colonel Rice said uh, basically to Vincent, we've always gone in together with the 83rd and asked for permission to be next to the 83rd like they typically were and, and then the 16th Michigan kind of waited until they got in position and the 16th, and the 16th Michigan, Michigan is on the right was also originally on the left well when they were coming up at the, uh, originally I think in the March they were in the lead right but the 20th Main I don't know if it's because when they turned around from heading towards the Wheatfield area that that, that things got mixed up I'm not sure exactly uh -huh. how that worked out but originally they were holding the left until Vincent moved them to the right according to I think uh, no I think um well, according to Fonz, anyway, uh, Strong Vincent is going to start the brigade at the left okay. at, at what we call Vincent Spur, and he's going to sh personally show Chamberlain where his left is supposed to be right. and hold the ground at all hazards. And then the 83rd Pennsylvania. and then Now, when they were going into the wheat field, when they thought they were going into the wheat field, it appeared as if the 20th Main was going to be between the, the 16th Michigan was going to be on their left. Yeah. But that didn't turn out that way when they get up there at Little Round Top. See, I think I think I was reading uh, Trudeau, and I think he had it where the 16th Main, just like what you said, they were to the left of the 20th Main, or the 16th Michigan was to the left of the 20th Main, then 83rd, then 44th. Right. And then Vincent said, no, 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 let's take the 16th over here because uh, I think the right needed a little more bolstering than the left because he could see the, uh, the Texans coming, I guess it would be. Yeah. I, I don't remember, but and, anyway. And it would, to get back to your question, though, it was the center two regiments that are going to be hit first. Yes. The 83rd Pennsylvania and the 44th New York. And they're taking on, at first, the 4th Alabama, which is part of Law's Brigade, as Jim said. and But also the 4th and the 5th Texas. So it was 4th Alabama, 5th Texas, 4th Texas. Those two regiments from Robertson's Brigade that had gotten mixed up. Robertson's men... Two of the regiments followed the general parameters of the overall plan where you follow the attack route using the Emmitsburg Road. So the 3rd uh, Arkansas and the 1st Texas, they're going to end up fighting near the Devil's Den area more, and even a little bit further west of that, like in the area between the Devil's Den and the wheat field. But the 4th and 5th Texas are going to end up coming right across Warren Avenue. The way most cars go up the little round top, when you right. first begin that rise, that would have been the... Uh, the 4th Texas, and then the 5th Texas, and then the 4th Alabama. They'd be to your left as and, you're going up the hill. And the fight began in the center of Vincent's Brigade. It's, it started to move over to the right. And then the 15th Alabama and the 47th Alabama, because um, the 47th Alabama's colonel is, is hurt or sick, I can't remember, but Bulger, if that's how you pronounce his name, is, temporary, is, is a lieutenant colonel, so Oates is taking temporary command. That, that delay that they had on the Gibraltar that you talked about is going to cause them to enter the fray, enter the fight late. So the 20th Maine's first firing is an oblique right, an angle to the right. right. They're firing into the right of the 4th Alabama. 4th Alabama, not 47th. So that's what I said. I no, because the 47th. So the 4th. So the, the 47th and the 15th are up there on, still up. on Big Round okay. Top. Now, the 47th isn't all the way at the top. The 47th is a much smaller regiment. Right. The 15th is a pretty big regiment. Right. Okay. But they're still up there. So, so these other three regiments are hitting Vincent's brigade first, and the fight develops from the center of Vincent's line towards his right. And then the 47th Alabama comes into the fray, and now they're taking fire from the 20th Maine as well. And then finally, the 15th Alabama swings around. Okay. So that, okay. Um, okay. So then um, there's fighting there between Vincent's Brigade and Law's Brigade. Is Vincent's Brigade the only brigade that is ever fighting up there during July 2nd's fight, or do more brigades come no, up? No, there's a second brigade um, under. Um Brigadier General by the name of Weed, Stephen Weed, who is also going to be following up the road, the Weedfield Road, headed west over the North Slope, a little round top. And I was just reading this today, and I didn't realize this. Um, the 140th New York that Patrick O'Rourke commanded, regiment, is part of Weed's brigade. 
I always assumed that they were at the lead of the brigade when Warren, uh, well, we should talk about Vincent. Vincent's brigade basically faces south. Everybody comes a little round top, they look at that gorgeous view, and they just assume that's where the initial fighting was. And Bob talked about it, uh, and I mentioned it myself, that, that the main attack, the original attack, is coming from big round top from the south. So Vincent's brigade actually faces south. From the 20th Maine on the southeastern spur to the 16th Michigan, which is kind of the south western part of Little Round Top. But as the Confederates uh, overtake uh, Devil's Den, they start to get into the Valley of Death on the west side of Little Round Top. And now the west side of the hill is unprotected. Vincent's right is exposed. Warren realizes the situation. And whereas he had sent a message by courier down to the Wheatfield Road that Vincent answered, now, he, so importantly, he personally goes down to the road and finds uh, Colonel O'Rourke's 140th, which is in the what I was reading today was in the back of the brigade line and O'Rourke answered the call to come up the hill and then the rest of the brigade <laughs> came up behind him. Oh, okay. And uh, basically the 140th went straight uh, toward uh, Vincent's brigade. Uh, O'Rourke gets killed almost immediately. But the key thing is uh, three other regiments of that Weed's brigade then began to cover the western side okay. of Little Round Top. So now Little Round Top is defended on the western side as well as the southern side because now the western side is threatened all the way around to the 155th Pennsylvania which is on the north side of the hill so vincent goes down and he happens to know patty o'rourke of the 140th new york warren well i'm sorry yeah warren warren, warren, warren. because they're both west pointers mm -hmm. and o'rourke had graduated i think top of his class a couple years before and wasn't 1861 was, wasn't warren the commander of yes. the regiment warren or something? Commanded that's right. that's right. commanded unit. warren was the brigade so they commander. knew each other yeah and so he's able to he must know. have been very happy <laughs> yeah i was just gonna say to can you imagine that O'Rourke. moment you're desperately looking for blue clad troops and you not only see blue clad troops come down the road, you see your old unit right yeah so there's no real hesitation when o'rourke from another west pointer warren Patty, that's why I said, right. no yeah, yeah, I think first thing. Says, Patty, I need you to come up which, on the hill. Which right. I think we need to point out, since we're talking about Little Round Top, something very unconventional happened twice within the space of, what, an hour or maybe a little over mm. an hour. Um, I, I, gave, I was giving a tour to a ranger um, this week, and I asked him... How uh, important is following the chain of command? And he looked over and scoffed. <laughs> like, no one challenges that. Do you mean you, an Army Ranger or a Park Ranger? Uh, uh, I'm sorry, a, a U.S. Army Ranger. Oh, now, he, was, he was a Vietnam I thought era. I a New York Ranger. Ranger, okay, I'm Hockey. sorry, I should have yeah, made that clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But since, you know, he was a, a decorated military man, I thought I'd, I'd ask, sure. and I often do that with people, because the chain of command is drilled into everyone. Right. Twice, in this fight for Little Round Top, Mm -hmm. Two Union colonels did not follow the chain of command, and they both ended up dead. Right. Mm. Strong Vincent. Let that be a lesson. And Patrick O'Rourke. Yeah. And you know, Bob, you touched on something a little earlier that I was going to mention, which I think is really interesting, is this fight never really should have been there. As you, as you said, the original idea for the attack was to attack along the Emmitsburg Road. In other words, attack right across the front of Little Round Top, left to right. And Hood actually disobeys orders. Um, there's a scene in the movie where he's talking about the attack with Longstreet. And he says, well, you know, if I attack uh, uh, the way they want, all those guys, meaning Union troops all around, all I got to do is throw rocks down on me. <laughs> and so he actually goes wide so that he can take Little Round Top in his path to clear any troops there out as he goes up Cemetery Ridge. So, you know, it's not even the original, mm -hmm. not even the original plan. You got to crumple that up and throw it Makes out. Nice little diversion there. Don't mm -hmm. you think we ought to have that famous quote done by a fan of Patrick Gorman right now? That would be great, Eric. <laughs> Oh, no, I'm cool. Oh, oh, man. I was looking forward to that. Wait, man, I don't you're the one who's good at voices. Oh, but I don't do, I do a do Patrick Gorman. down on me. Well, I could always tear, tear, I could cut this out if I did. Why don't you ask All Patrick? All I got to do is throw rocks yeah. down on All me. All I got to do <laughs> is no, roll trouble. rocks down yeah, on me. That's, that's what I was looking for. <laughs> Matt's good, good at that stuff. That, Mine sounded yeah, horrifying. Eric's good, too. But what you ought to do. Eric sounds like your cavalryman. Do your cavalryman. No, I'm not doing that right now. He does. Because there might be some listening. All of his impressions are like Gabby Hayes. They're like, that's really the only I voice I know how to do. Is hey, like, who's that old codger? Oh, oh, just okay. Stay away from my still gold. up in the mountains. Hey, Matt, what you need to do is you need to phone Patrick Gorman tonight. Yeah. And see if he'll say it. Record him saying it. And then play it right after you. There you go. See, I, we should have planned this. I could, I could have him ready on a phone right now, and I could have put it that on speakerphone. Yeah. I go, yeah. Go. We got Eric's recording, your recording, and Patrick Gorman's, and you ask your listeners. Vote for which one oh, is the, the most like Patrick Gorman. It's like that show called To Tell the Truth. <laughs> yeah. We're the real Patrick Gorman. God, you know, I hope he, mine wasn't caught. <laughs> oh, Patrick Gorman is the actor that played General Hood. Yes. Just so your listeners know that. Oh, yeah. And yeah. Can I just say something about him? 
Sure. He went to the reenactment shortly after the movie came out. I'll never forget this. And after the reenactment was essentially over the fight and people were streaming out, he sat in a tent in extremely hot weather. Mm. And every single person that came up that wanted an autograph, he signed it. Not only that, but he'd have something to say to each person yeah. approached. He's Patrick Gorman is a great, great guy. I got to hang out with him for a whole weekend. Oh. And uh, I, I, I arranged for him to stay at my friend's farm. And I was like, I said, I'll be your chauffeur. I'll take you anywhere. You, I just, one condition. And he's like, what? And I said, let me record our conversations. Oh. And he said, oh, yeah, no problem. And it, we sat and talked. the whole, Like, anytime he didn't have to be anywhere, we would just sit around and shoot the shit, shoot the breeze. And it, <laughs> no, it's not for cursing. It's for umming. Um, and uh, he's a very nice guy. Yeah, we've really we've had uh, we've had you know live videos where my listeners get to ask him questions, and he sits and talks to him. He loves it. He he says that this this being in this movie was like, you know, people know him from this, and they're very nice, and they love him, and and he loves it. So he's he's a really cool guy. What Jim is too humble to say is that he used to be the announcer for the reenactments. That is true, and that's how he could know that Patrick Gorman was doing that. I, did, I actually kind of forgot about that. <laughs> this is the first year in 17 years that I haven't, oh, haven't done man. that. So. Do you miss it? No. No. Uh, it was a good time. It was a good time. I, I really enjoyed it. But so, um, it's hot. Patrick O'Rourke. Right. Patrick O'Rourke. So, as opposed supposedly to Patrick Supposedly, the, the guy who shot him, they found 17 bullet holes in his head. Is or not his head. Right? Not his head. But in in him, in the, really, the guy who shot him, supposedly. How do yeah. they know that? Fonts says that. You know, I, you know what we were talking before about. Yeah, this Fonts. The uh, Fonts? Fonts has that. Uh, I, I don't know if I could find it that quick. Seventeen. But, Good uh, gosh. But you know, your your memory does <sighs> such things to you. So I didn't used to know that when I was giving tours. Was he someone special? Why would they take the time to count how many uh, holes uh, he had in him? Here, I don't have my glasses. Okay, read this up here. This is Fonts page, whatever that says. Uh-huh, page 230 in uh, Fonts Gettysburg, the second day. O'Rourke shouted, here they are, men. Commence firing. A Confederate about 40 feet away spotted O'Rourke and shot at him. O'Rourke fell with a mini ball through his neck. Many men from Company A and G returned their fire immediately, and after the battle, the curious counted 17 holes in the brave Confederate's body. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So, memory, I thought I got that from Jim Miller. You know Jim. Yeah, I know he Jim. He used to give bicycle mm-hmm. tours for us. And I had forgotten where I got that story. So one day I was up at Little Rod's Off and Jim was giving a tour. And I said, hey, Jim, where is that story that you told me about the guy getting 17? And he said, Bob, you told me that. <laughs> 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 so I must have remembered it once, set it on a tour, and then forgotten and where forgot. I even got it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So. Uh, where where do we leave off as far as the battle goes, though? Uh, uh, okay. just works come. There. There. Weed's brigade's coming up. Mm-hmm. Go there. ahead. Well, there's another kind of major action. Go for it. Uh, Bernie's division, which is the division that was facing southwest from the Devil's Den through the wheat field up to the peach orchard, has been crushed by the combined attacks of Hood's and McClaws's division. So the Devil's Den has fallen, as Jim said before. Benning's Brigade is is here now too, and uh, although they're not going to advance to Little Round Top, you do have uh, members of Wolford's Brigade, Kershaw's Brigade, Anderson's Brigade coming through that wheat field, coming down Hawks Ridge, forcing out the United States regulars and what's left of Caldwell's division, and threatening the Valley of Death, as some call it, but that area just west of Little Round Top. But by this time, um, the Pennsylvania Reserves. And would you please pick up this story? Because I know you love the Reserves, and they don't get enough attention. This is Eric Eric, Mone. the producer. Oh, we're talking about when, uh, when the Reserves pushed Wofford back? You bet. Okay. So <clears throat> this is right after the regulars get, get pushed out of the wheat field. Uh, McCandless's brigade of the Pennsylvania Reserves shows up on the north slope of Little Round Top. Uh, kind of stretched, I think, between where the Gibbs Battery Monument is now and uh, Munchauer Knoll. All right. So that's on either side of what we call today the Wheatfield Road yeah. that goes over the yeah. North Slope a little round top. Um, so they, they get a raid. They've got three regiments in the front, two in the rear. Uh, and while they're advancing from little round top through plum run valley they end up picking up a regiment from the sixth corps just kind of jumps in on the right on the right flank i can't remember Is that the 139th yeah i believe so that, that might be them 
Um, Pennsylvania. Yeah. Uh, they they move across Plum Run, up Hawks Ridge, and then into that strip of woods that kind of separates Hawks Ridge from the wheat field now. Uh, there is a low stone wall that runs along the eastern edge of that. North-south so, running. Yeah, exactly. The, the side closest to Plum Run, you'll find that stone wall. That's kind of where they halt their advance. And they stay there through the night of July 2nd into the afternoon of July 3rd and might be getting way off track now. But uh, after Pickett's charge, after Farnsworth's charge on the south end of the field, uh, the reserves end up pushing out through the wheat field. And then the three left regiments swing to the left and sweep through Rhodes' woods to their south all the way out to... uh, basically a line between the devil's den and the timbers farm and that kind of ends their their action yeah. so but bigger picture so there is little round top is now safe yes there's a quite a few union forces on little round top now vincent's entire brigade the uh brigades of mccandless and fisher of yeah the so Corps. fisher ends the, up on on the left right and and if you go up to big round top now and actually it's they start in the saddle between the two round tops, you'll find the monuments for, it's like the 9th, 10th, 5th, uh, and I can't remember uh, the other two regiments that are up there, but there's mm-hmm. three on top of Big Round Top and, and two down at close the Close to the roads, right. In the saddle. So my point in, in big terms, though, is Little Round Top is now safe. Okay, that last threat when the wheat field was finally taken by the Confederates, but they were pushed right back across it, as Eric said. Yeah. But I, north, I think Tim Smith kind of described it once where, you know, Wofford's Brigade of Georgians has found this seam between the two lines where basically the whole north slope of Little Round Top uh, and, and that gap between there and Munchauer's Knoll is wide open. And all of a sudden, McCandless's brigade shows there. up and they just, it kind of crushes their will. Right. To keep moving forward, and they pull back yeah. through the wheat. And one of the reasons why it's open is because that's the area from which the United States regulars had launched their advance across into the wheat field area, but they're driven out of the wheat field, too. So things were a mess, things were looking bad, but a whole bunch of things are going to happen at the same time around Little Round Top. The 20th Maine is going to make a bayonet charge, maybe just after. Colonel Patrick O'Rourke, and, and the 140th New York, that was a big regiment. It had, well, I don't know exactly. Some of you guys know all this stuff. But it was 500, over 500 men. Yeah. yeah. That's a big regiment. Yeah. And um, so th- th- Colonel O'Rourke and the 140th New York arrives to push. This was the third attack of the 4th and 5th Texas, okay? Mm. They had made two. And then, okay, here comes help coming from, from like the Devil's Den area, maybe, although Benning didn't advance. But they try one more time. And they're within 20 yards of the Yankees of, of O'Rourke's men when they were coming down. And they're pushed back down the hill. So it was close. It was mm. nip and tuck. Yeah. That drama that I think the movie captures pretty well focuses just on the 20th Maine. That doesn't mean it wasn't dramatic. But there was maybe equally dramatic stories with Patrick O'Rourke's arrival. Just as Colonel Strong Vincent will be mortally wounded as the 16th Michigan, there's a mistake. Um, a lieutenant in the 16th Michigan is going to order the flag to fall back, and he had no authority to do that. <laughs> yeah. And about 45 men from the 16th Michigan also fell back a little bit. Oh, yeah. And yeah. so the 16th Michigan is beginning to crumble. And as an Ohio State fan, I would love to point out that Michigan cannot hold Ohio State's line, <laughs> and they couldn't hold Texas's line either on that particular day without the help of the 140th wow. New York. Wow. But so it was nip if and If I understood sports, I'd yeah. know but, how but powerful like Jim that said, was. now you have Weed's Brigade coming up as well. Well, you've got McCandless's uh, men, Fisher's men. Um, you have Little Round Top is an island of security at this point because the rebels are falling back through the wheat field. Mm-hmm. Devil's Den will stay in their possession, but but Little Round Top is now secure. But to the north, there's a huge hole yet, and that's got to be the subject of another no, yeah. another. Uh, podcast. But yes. Hancock rises, not just Hancock, McGilvery, Hancock. William Colville, the commander of the 1st Minnesota, Willard's Brigade, the 111th picture you have, Harper's Ferry Cowards right, redeemed right, their, right. their Bigelow. honor. Yeah. His bad. Bigelow. Bam, bam, Bigelow. Right. There's all sorts of heroics at this point. Yeah. All right. Well, then uh, let's get into, uh, well, I guess that we could we could say that the end of the story is that the Union holds 
Little Round Top. And it's because of the Pennsylvania Reserve. And it's because of... <laughs> <laughs> or, or for Tim Smith, it was just because of Joshua yeah. Lawrence Chamberlain. It was only <laughs> Joshua Chamberlain. All right, let's move on to our questions then from our patrons over at patreon.com. Evan Clapsaddle is going to start us off. I love that name, Clapsaddle. Yeah. He says, Matt, I would love to hear the LBG's take on how far Lee's scouts reconnoitered early on the morning of July 2nd did any Confederates make it up to Little Round Top? So before the, the, the overall assault of Longstreet's Corps begins on the Union left, uh, Lee, in the early hours of the morning, sends uh, a couple of guys, right? Captain Johnston and who, a couple of other people with him, something like that, uh, down to reconnoiter the area, see what's going on down there. He claims that he got up to Little Round Top, but there's some... I wouldn't say controversy, but there's a question. Uh, nobody's really sure. Go ahead, Jim. Give us. Uh, no, I think know. you just answered it. All it's right, controversial. It's a question whether he ever got up. Yeah, there. don't know. We don't know. Um, I guess it's everybody. You know, uh, decide for yourself. Uh, he insisted, I think, that he got up there. Yeah, I think I think he did, and I think he said no one was there. But but we know that there were there was a signal corps station up there even early in the morning, correct? Yeah, but he's up there pretty much during pre-dawn hours. Yeah. And <sighs> they still still wouldn't have been up there though? And and the left of Yeah, ooh, yeah Geary's uh, was it Geary's well, they're division, at the foot right? Of the hill, right. Right. They're they're at the very northern slope. But they wouldn't have had Oh, and then you had Buford's cavalry is out front on the Emmitsburg Road. They're at the Peach Orchard, right? Yeah. Essentially out there. Um so he, he would have had to go way south right. and then cut east and then cut north just to get to Little Round Top. Yeah. Well, or luckily get like between like the Spangler Farm. Wait, is that the Spangler Farm? Where is it that Kemper started off? That's the Spangler Farm, right? Yes. Yeah. So Spangler Farm, like across. He goes. Johnson he, goes well beyond that. No, I know, but I'm saying that's what I'm saying is he'd have to go really far south right. to be able to get up on Little Round Top, right? Because he'd have to skirt all those Union troops right. over there. They, I think they kind of went behind Seminary Ridge, like you know where the Eisenhower Farm is today. The Longstreet mm-hmm. Tower kind of used that as concealment. And I just happened to see this this summer. They were showing an old, few years old uh, ranger program that the Pennsylvania Cable Network does. Uh, they filmed the rangers doing the anniversary tours, and Troy Harmon was doing Johnston's reconnaissance. And basically what Troy said is that Johnston's men, and even though it was dark, I guess there was some moonlight, they moved kind of along where the Pitcher Woods is in concealment because there was traffic on the Emmitsburg Road. And he claims they went down even beyond where West Confederate Avenue crosses Emmitsburg Road, what they used to call Pinch Gut, and now becomes South Confederate Avenue. Mm -hmm. And he's basically up on the ridge, kind of near where the picnic area is today, maybe just shy of the Alabama Moor or somewhere near that. And he said at that point, he said they hid in the woods because there was Union cavalry traffic on the Emmitsburg Road. And they didn't want to get detected. So they had to hide in the woods, wait for the traffic to go by, and then sneak across the Emmitsburg Road. But he basically said that they went kind of toward Bushman's, Bushman's Hill, which this brings up an interesting point because you could say if Johnston said he made it up to Little Round Top, people could say, well, you made it up to Big Round Top. You got confused. Well, he ought to know if he went down a hill and went up another hill. Mm-hmm. But then you bring in Bushman Hill. What if what if Johnston went over Bushman Hill and thought that was Big Round Top and then made his way on to okay. Big Round Top and thought he was on Little Round Top and never actually made it because it's dark. So was somewhere in that area but apparently to answer the question how far did he go down apparently he went down all to about well he mentions they mentioned uh where the farnsworth attack occurred the next day okay that's kind of where they crossed well that's right down oh, there yeah all down right. there you know where the soldiers and sales confederate memorial is and the road it's extreme southern sure, end of the sure. national military park where the uh, south confederate avenue goes. so he got in the area but not up on top of little round i don't know you know um well, I mean, it makes to me it makes the most sense that he got to the area you're saying by the the far right of the of the Confederate yeah. line. I think he came very close to Bushman Hill, maybe gone over part of it. I think he definitely got up on Big Round Top. Whether he went further than that, who knows? Hmm. So, for what it's worth, mm-hmm. fonts, and you know, I think the world of fonts. Yeah, um, page one hundred seven of again Gettysburg, the second day. Um, I'll I'll just state start here near the seminary building. He found the General, Lee, there, sitting on a log, talking with Generals Hill and Longstreet. They were looking at a map, and as General Lee talked, he pointed to it. 
When Lee saw Johnston, he called him over, and the captain stood behind the generals, leaned over their shoulders, and indicated the route that he had just traveled. When he said that he had been to Little Round Top, Lee turned, looked up, and asked, Did you get there? I'm assuming he pointed, if this is true, and this is coming from Johnston, from some of his letters, according to the footnotes. Johnson assured him that he had and stepped back when he finished. Hmm. So I don't think they were up in that cupola. My question is, you can't see Little Round Top from down below today, but could you have? I think think you could have because it wasn't as treed. So the, the point is Lee thought. He got there. Yeah. And Lee took his word as to the location of the Union left. And maybe Johnston thought he got there too, but he Correct. got I don't think anyone else. did anything. Well, I mean, they on, don't even yeah, know. I mean, the right. name's big and Little Round Top yes. don't even come to after Correct. Right. They're just those rocky hills. Exactly. Right. And, and so Lee, when Lee says... Go ahead. I'm sorry. I think we're going to make the we, same we, point. You, you should make there? it. You, you mentioned he said that. And Johnston said, I did. Well, they could be talking about two different things. Right. But think they're talking about the same thing. But one of them is half bald and the other one is all wooded kind of like you and me man <laughs> yeah, but it's nighttime man it's dark that. oh that's true that's true so he wouldn't know or eric's even more wooded than i am <laughs> I, I believe you call it lush foliage okay oh my <laughs> above and below the nose <laughs> As uh, is bill etzcorn is tortured he says i have a question i rubbed patrick o'rourke's nose for good luck in early March 2020, and it didn't work. Is the fact that he was killed there the reason why 2020 is kind of horrible? No, Bill. It's because you did something that the Park Service doesn't want you to do. And when I gave you a tour, oh, hold it. That was just the first day, wasn't it? I was going to say, I probably told you you're not supposed to rub the nose. Oh, Bill. That's what we're supposed to tell people, but most people believe they get good luck if they rub an Irishman's nose. Well, clearly. So people go up to... Patrick O'Rourke all the time and rub the Irishman's yeah. nose. And guess what? <laughs> all the tarnish is removed yeah. at no cost to the park. <laughs> <laughs> and it gets oil. So next year, the tradition is rub his forehead, the year after that, his cheeks, then his chin. And within four or five years, there'll It'll be no be tarnish yeah. to the park. Just we ought to start face. a rumor about the, the patina on the cannons, although I understand the patina <laughs> protects the cannons, so I guess we should yeah, probably. Yeah. yeah, it does. Yeah. Uh, all right, so uh, Serge has this next one. He says, hey, Matt, hope you're doing well. Here's an, a little round top question I've been wondering for a while. Really hope to see you guys in September. September's tour is uh, September 19th. It's free also. Unlike so much of the ground that the battle was fought upon, little round top, which is literally a pile of rock, would seem one hell of a difficult place to bury dead soldiers. Anyone who has ever walked around up their knows it's so rocky that it would be a real endeavor to dig an actual hole without busting your shovel or hurling it or hurling it in disgust. So where were the dead from Little Round Top buried initially in the days following the fight? They were hauled or were they hauled down to the lower, easier ground to dig in, or were they somehow actually buried right there on the hill? We have the Elliott map here, which is an awesome map. It shows burials. Some I've heard have said some of it can't be right, um, but not uh, not in relation to Little Round Top, from what I hear. So, what do we know about burials on Little Round Top? Well, I think they're like burials really anywhere. Um, I was doing a little research today. I was reading uh, about the 155th Pennsylvania. Um, my great uncle was in that unit, and he talked about uh, a couple of guys that were killed uh, in the unit. Matter of fact, I think they're the same company. One guy's name was Wyckoff. I forget what the other guy's name was. But he said, we took them to the rear. Well, the rear would be the eastern side. But of course, if you know anything about the eastern side, a little round top, you know, it's like the western side. It's just only it's not cleared. It's it's steep, it's rocky, and it's heavily wooded. So, and then uh, you guys want to either Eric or Matt sent a copy of the Elliott map. Then Bob brings a an enlarged map of the Elliott map. Yeah. And it clearly shows burials along the tiny town road behind little round top. Yeah. But it, it, also, sense the world. it also it also seems to show, show them on sort top. Of at the top, like about where. Yeah, kind I of wasn't sure the if they were burial markers or where they were just showing the original position of the troops. No, no, no. Those are Some Union those. graves, and then there's Rebel graves there, well, then right around the where the 20th so Main those would Those two right? lines there, right yes. about the 20th Main's position, right I think. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. Was those that all buried? These are the earthworks or breastworks. If that's the case, then then it's like Serge said. Those guys had some awfully tough diggings. But there's many more. East of the Tawny Town Road yeah. at the hospitals. Like that's you take, what kind of surprised me. East yeah. of the Tawny Town Road. Yeah, but yeah. that's you take people like Colonel Strong Vincent, who's mortally wounded, 
trying to keep the, the Michigan boys as they're breaking in line. Uh, he will be carried to the Tony Town Road, mm-hmm. I think, to the Weikert House. Yeah. And he's going to die there five days later. So he's probably buried originally back in weed, there. Weed is taken there. Of course, these are high-ranking yeah, officers, right. so they get to go to the nice house. Hazlet, yeah. But it makes Rourke. sense, though, that there would be more back here because this is open Those fields. Are, these are farm yeah. fields. But if you look... Yeah. yeah. Which are along the What'd Tony you say, Town Road. Waylon? Sure. I was always under the impression <laughs> that they were Everybody all taken out by the wagon trains, which were... Out on the yeah town. right, well, and it just makes more sense. It would be out there. So those are plowed fields, and it'd be easier it's to level. take. Plus, you guys, rocky. It, th- these are probably hospitals as well. The other thing you I noticed, think though, about that though. I, go ahead. See, here's my beef with that notion: is when are they burying these guys? Are they burying them on the second? I don't no. think so. No, no, no. So these these fellows have been dead for couple days so they're dragging do you bloated really bodies. want to carry dead bodies they throw them in a wagon yards when yeah it's it's gonna be difficult and it's not a great job in the first place right. but you know you could probably scratch out a trench big enough for no but i'm, I'm 20, guessing that a lot of these guys the these people here east of the tawny town road those are coming were, from field hospitals. yeah and 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 they could have been wounded in little this area. Sure, yeah, sure. I mean, they probably were and brought back here and died. Sure. Because you think about how many actually died. I don't know. I'm, it's probably knowable. But if, let's say, the 20th Maine had about 360 men, not counting officers, and I know that's some, somewhat debatable too, but let's say they had 360 men. Are you looking so, something up here? Good. Uh, let's say they suffered 30% casualties, which is, I think, about what they suffered, maybe 33. Mm-hmm. So if it was 30%. Oh, my math skills are going to be poorly taxed. That would just, be just to make it make it. If it's three hundred men, it would be a hundred men eight that would or so be. casualties. Yeah, and typically about twenty percent of casualties are killed. So maybe they lose twenty dead. I don't even know. That might be an exaggeration, but it's not like there's I rem- hundreds I, and hundreds right. of so, dead. Right. According right. to the War Department tablet for Vincent's brigade only, the entire brigade. Has six officers killed and 83 men killed. Uh, wounded 17 officers, officers, 236 men captured or missing 11. So a total of 353, but altogether 89 dead from In Vincent's, Vincent's brigade. Brigade. The brigade. Right. Just Vincent's. Right. And I bet if you looked up weeds, you wouldn't find very many. Maybe a Rourke's men suffered the most there, but. Well, you know, if you go. I don't think the 146, the 155th. Well, the 91st Pennsylvania lost Stephen Weed, didn't it? Mm. Yeah. He died at Spangler Farm. And the Spangler Farm is kind of not that far from where Captain Marill, 20th Main Company B is. If you take that hike from the 20th Main, the parking lot, back in that area, that's pretty level. Yeah. And the other thing is this. Think about the final resting place for these guys in the National Cemetery. They're originally buried on the battlefield. When they're buried in the cemetery, they're, they're buried at two to three feet deep. Not the standard six foot depth. So my point is... When they originally bury these guys on the field, really shallow graves. So maybe, even though that ground is kind of rocky on the eastern side, if you're not digging that deep, you could get those guys under the ground. And I wonder how much of, I mean, we look at that today and it's very rocky because we've tread upon it and all the dirt has been eroded away. So I wonder back then... Would it? I mean, you How might much have of it had has it. changed because yeah. there's been two separate tour roads put in on top a little. Exactly. Top. Exactly. Um, exactly. But Be- yeah, you're 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 absolutely right, Jim. When you're when you're digging these temporary graves, okay, so you dig down six eight inches, and now we're hitting heavy rock. Right. So what do we do? Okay, we lay the guys in the trench that we've dug that's only six or eight inches deep, and then we dig earth from around it and pile it mm-hmm, on top mm-hmm. to make sure they're a little bit deeper. Because but, they're only temporary. They're only meant to sure, be temporary. Exactly. If, if you notice on the Elliott map, it's also around little streams, like a feeder to Plum Run coming mm-hmm. in from the east. There's a bunch of Confederate burials there. Softer ground. Softer ground, mm-hmm. right. Along um, Plum Run on the west side. Like east of the wheat field, there's quite a few yeah. Confederate burials in that area. And again, sure. this is where Crawford Avenue goes today, sure. mm. and Warren Avenue goes today. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, everything was changed by the roads, but they probably had softer ground <laughs> down I, in there. I would imagine so. Well, especially after you know it rained all down the fourth. Yeah. yeah. So that's going to make the ground even softer to begin with. Disgusting. Uh, that's an interesting question. 
Do I? It was an interesting question. Yeah, it is a good question. Serge, Serge has some good questions. No, that, no, was, that was Serge. Serge. Uh, Michael Lentz is up next. Michael asks, uh, my question is really in the weeds, but owing to how far they had marched that day, why was Law's Brigade tasked with the leading role in the assault that day? A little commentary from myself that reveals my armchair generalship connected to this question, but it may have been a bit much to ask men who had marched 20 plus miles to assault Little Round Top. Well, I think that's a great question. Uh, you know, how many people have ever brought that up? Why would you take the guys that have marched 27 miles and put them uh, to kick off the attack on right, the Right, put them well, in the second line. You want me to try to tackle it? Go ahead. That? Okay. Laws Brigades we talked about earlier. Start of the day, around 2 o'clock in the morning. 27 miles away, we can debate a few miles from that, but around New Guilford uh, on the other side of the mountain. Um, so they were left there to cover the Confederate rear until Pickett's division had come up uh, from Chambersburg to, mm. to guard the Confederate rear and the, and the uh, supply line and the retreat route and the communications. Um, so once Pickett's division arrived, then they were free to catch up. So they had to make that forced march. Um, they're part of Hood's division, and Hood's division comes up behind Seminary Ridge, and they begin to deploy or set up to the right. And I think the reason that Law was sent to the extreme right is because the other brigades were already in position. Now, you could say that these guys were exhausted. Why don't you just move them uh, into position, have everybody shift down? And I think uh, because it was so late in the day and they were anxious to make the attack, it was probably easier just to send one brigade down to the end of the line and, and say make the attack, sure. then to shift three other brigades down sure. and try to get these guys to move in. Mm, okay. Well, here, here, here's my take on it: is they're not even supposed to be in that configuration in the first place. McClaws' division is supposed to be on the right. Mm -hmm. Hood's supposed to be on the left, and when they figure out that right. that Dan Sickles has moved out to the to the Emmitsburg Road, they have to switch that up to be able to right. get around his flank. So he, yeah, so the, the plan wasn't that he was supposed to be the first brigade yeah, in. And, and to my mind, and I might be absolutely dead wrong about this, but to my mind, Little Round Top isn't supposed to be assaulted at all. Well, that's, that's... They're supposed to just get astride the Emmitsburg Road and push north and hit the second corps. Right, because the order the wasn't right. general law, attack Little Round Top, yeah. right? Yeah. That's right. Right. Yeah, the order was to find the end of the Union line after Sickles had moved out. Because the original plan was to come out of the woods along the Millerstown Road or the Wheatfield Road today, move out, seize the Peach Orchard, put artillery there, launch attack from there. But at around 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the second day, when the Confederates come out near where the Longstreet Tower is today, Sickles was out there 600 yards in the front. So now they have to go down to the right, and they're basically ordered to find the end of the Union line, get beyond it, and attack it from the end. Because remember, the original order was the attack up the Emmitsburg Road. Right. Well, so when Laws Alabamans arrive, and they go all the way down to the end of the line, they can now see, thanks to the tree removal a few years ago by the park, you yeah. can sit up there by the uh, Alabama Memorial, you can look down and you can see Devil's End. You can yep. see where the Union troops were. Hey, we've gotten around the end of the line. We've reached the point where we make the attack. And I think they were sent down there simply because we're trying to extend the line as far as we have to, to see the end of the Union line. Laws gets down there and sees it. One more thing, Laws is the last brigade to arrive because they were guarding the supplies in New Guilford. Longstreet is waiting for Laws' brigade. I think when Lee comes back from talking to Ewell and telling his, explaining his role in this, that diversionary attack, um, he's a little unhappy that Longstreet hasn't left yet. And one of the explanations from Longstreet is that we're waiting for Law, mm -hmm. which is a good brigade. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm just, I don't know this for a fact, but I, I expect the rest of the brigades are ready to go. And mm -hmm. Laws arrives and just tacks on at the end. Mm -hmm. And where does Law end up? At the end of the line. Right. Why? Okay. Because when the first units come in, they attach to the right of McClaws, right? And then we've got the last brigade right. to arrive is okay. going to go over there. Now, why, why the two Georgia brigades of Anderson and Benning were behind Law, I don't know. Maybe that was a decision that Hood made that he wanted the attack to begin with Law and Robertson. It's probably mm -hmm. knowable. I just don't know that. Mm. But they were the last brigade to arrive. Okay. Anything more? Not for me. Okay. All right. Uh, this is uh, Spencer Frogner. Mm -hmm. He says, uh, and I think this is his first time sending a question. He says, hi, Matt. Um, and this is my first time submitting a question. Oh, <laughs> he says it right there. 
I had always promised myself never to ask something about the 20th Main, but here we are. Thank this- you, Spencer. <laughs> Tim Smith. <laughs> this is I a question you, from myself <laughs> and on behalf of my friend Brooke. Why was William Oates' pursuits to have a monument on the 15th Al- or to the 15th Alabama continually shot down by the park commissioners in the early 20th century? In particular, on what terms would they not approve such a monument? Did Chamberlain or any of the other members of the 20th Maine have any influence on this decision? Thank you for taking the time to read this question and consider it for being on Ask a Gatesburg Guide. Go ahead, Jim. Uh, okay, I'll let you other guys... Uh talk about this but i'll just say a couple things first of all because i'm not real i don't know a whole lot about this but i do know this that when the confederates first tried to put monuments in this field first maryland 1886 1892 there was opposition by union veterans and i also understand that apparently there was some conflict between chamberlain and oates as to where oates actually was which mm-hmm. led to chamberlain being somewhat against them putting a monument there but, uh, you know, this leads into what's happening today in 2020. You know, there's people that want to get rid of state monuments. But one of the reasons we have the state memorials, the Confederate state memorials, is the Union vet- veterans were against Confederates putting monuments in the field, particularly putting monuments to where the Confederate units had advanced to. Mm-hmm. So today you see jump off points. There's, a, there's an exception, Lev, Mississippi, near the Bryan Barn. But a lot of them are jump off points and not advance. And I'll just, one other thing I'll say, and then I'll turn it over to you guys. Um, I don't know if you guys knew this or not, some of you might, but Pickett's division had an entire monument built that lists all the brigades, all units, even the two brigades that weren't here, Corson and um, Jenkins. Jenkins. And they wanted to put it up there at the angle. And the Union veterans said, you're not going to do it. Well, they already had it built. You can go see it today in Hollywood Cemetery, really? Western Virginia. Oh, that's it's so cool. big. It's a big thing. It's got like five sides for each of the brigades. It's got bronze. It lists all the units. Wow. But originally, I was supposed to be in Gettysburg, but the Union veterans said no. That's so it's cool. in Hollywood Cemetery. That's so cool. That's as much as I, I didn't know that. Well, Bob, do you have anything to add to the... Uh, I think we we should hear from Eric, because Eric there's a, the, we were yeah. talking about this before, and there's yeah. a boulder that Eric will tell you about, mm-hmm. and where the monument might have been and why. Yeah, so um, I, there was a lecture done, I think by a ranger a number of years ago that I listened to. Uh, and they, they talked about this specific issue. Uh, there was a fair amount of pushback from Joshua Chamberlain specifically uh, when Oates was proposing to put his monument up. Uh, because in Chamberlain's mind, at least, if, if, I don't know if this is actually true or not, but the boulder that it was supposed to be put on where John Oates was killed uh, was within the 20th Maine's line. Mm-hmm. And, of course, you've, you've got the line of battle policy from the GBMA. Which is, uh, explain that. To so, the audience. line of battle policy basically talks about where these guys could place their monuments. And I, I'm not going to get into the particulars of it, but you could not have Confederate monuments within Union lines, mm-hmm. uh, which is why you see the 1st Maryland CSA just on the other side of the breastworks occupied by the 29th Pennsylvania on the 3rd. <clears throat> and that was a whole other thing. That was, why there that's was a there. whole lot of controversy yeah. surrounding that monument when it was put up, but that's and the, But there are a few exceptions, though, um, like the Armistead marker is behind the The Armistead lines. marker is placed by the Philadelphia Brigade Association. But it's still a Confederate marker. It is, but it's a Union Veterans Organization that petitions the GBMA to put this one marker up, and they win. It's the same reason why the 72nd Pennsylvania Mm -hmm. is right up on the wall at the angle. GBMA stands for Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association. It was the organization that first started the national park before it became a national park. Yeah. now I forgot where I was going with that. Well, um, you're talking about so John uh, Oates is, yeah, is John Oates. theoretically killed on this rock. William Oates wants to place the 15th Alabama monument on there. Joshua Chamberlain's not having it because it's within his lines. Uh, he's also got the the GBMA line of battle policy backing him up on this. Uh, even after the War Department takes over in 1895, he's still got a whole lot of clout with the War Department uh, because he is who he is and he writes as prolifically mm-hmm. as he does. Uh, and I think it really just comes down to 
Chamberlain outlasts William Oates. I don't mm. know when Oates dies, but I know Chamberlain dies in 1914, mm. yeah, which is pretty six. late in the game, truthfully. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think that's really what it comes down to, is mm-hmm. he had a loud enough voice, and he lasted longer. Yeah, so it helps to live longer. This boulder that Eric is talking about, if you've been on a 20th Main's line, if you can picture the left flank monument... If you look west of that, I'm guessing what, Eric, maybe 15 yards, maybe 20 yards in that range. Yeah, it's not far. There's a boulder. It's not terribly big. Um, about if you were to tip over two wheelbarrows, that would be about that high and about that big. But supposedly, maybe a little bigger than that. But supposedly, John Oates, the brother of Colonel William Calvin Oates, the commander of the 15th Alabama, was wounded right there by that boulder. And if so, it would indicate that the Confederates in their last surge, just before the famous bayonet charge, had gotten well behind the 20th Maine's line, about at the center of their line, but behind it, from the opposite direction, from the flank. But as we were talking before, they the 20th Maine was bent back on itself Correct. in a very Starting out as a straight angle. line. They started out basically at a 90-degree angle, but just a right angle in the line, and progressively get pushed further and further back, and they almost look like a bobby pin yeah. mm. uh, before the bayonet right. charge. But just to follow up on something I said, uh-huh. uh, William C. Oates died in 1910. Okay. So, so that so may or may not, not be not, the case, yeah. but I suspected it. All right. Um, I always wonder, though, with all the controversy over the death of John Oates, what Daryl Hall has to say about that. Oh, my. Hall Oates. <laughs> Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. Richard Fish says, hi, Matt. I've heard Gary Edelman argue that Little Round Top was not the key to the battlefield because the Confederates had too little force to hold the hill if captured. However, I understand Lee's Day 2 plan to be to drive the U.S. left flank wherever it rested towards Cemetery Hill, as we established before. Holding Little Round Top or any other place on Cemetery Ridge was not the objective. Therefore, might we see overrunning Little Round Top as just the first step in a necessary chain of events leading to the weakening and collapse of the left flank under the weight of the entire Confederate pressure on the left? Isn't holding the hill irrelevant to the plan? If the left flank is driven uh, in on the ridge, who cares about Little Round Top than in the Confederate rear? Richard Fish out of San Antonio, Texas. So in other words, I guess what he's saying is the, the goal wasn't to capture the hill to hold. It was to capture the hill to keep on going. Does that sound about right? I think, I think he's right. And I think Little Round Top is more important to the Union Army than it is the Confederate Army. Mm. Because... Uh, as we've said before, you know, people get up a little round top and they say, my gosh, if you got up here, you put artillery up here, you can shoot right down the Union line and you'd, you'd outflank them, enfilade them, whatever. Uh, well, it doesn't, it's not a good artillery position if you can't get artillery up there in the first place <laughs> because you got to bring it from big round top, which is big, it's high, it's rocky, it's wooded. Um, and the second thing is the terrain. Yeah. If you attack from Little Round Top of Cemetery Ridge, drive through there. Drive down Ayers Avenue, or Sykes Avenue, to the yeah. north. It's just nothing but trees on either side of yeah. you. And even when you come out, uh, when you get past the Millerstown Road, and you head up by Sedgwick, it's still more trees and low swampy ground. It's not good ground. The, the, right, I was going to say, the ground is like very swampy, and, yeah. and it's deceptively not rocky. It's rocky. If you if you ever do you ever walk out in there? Yeah. Yeah, it, there's some well, boulders Well, up to the right everything. of the road, to the east of uh, um, Sedgwick Avenue, uh, it, it, it's kind of rocky, but it's mm-hmm. mainly wooded. It's right. elevated. Yeah. No, but, I'm talking to the west of the road. Oh, to so, the west. Well, that's the probably the, low, that's the lowest ground of the battlefield. Yeah. It's swampy. Swampy. It's not good for artillery. I think. Rocky. I think it has a lot to do with why signals move forward. But, you know, we addressed this on Addressing Gettysburg before when we were in the studio. I think I remember talking about this. And I got to give credit to Special Forces retired Colonel Gavin Kavanagh. Because he's the one that, that said we were doing a staff ride one time. He mm-hmm. was training us how to do military. And he, he says what you really have to think about, people don't think about too much, is logistics, supply lines. He said the real value of Little Round Top is the Tawny Town Road. Now, when the second day of the battle begins, the Union Army only controls three roads in and out of Gettysburg. That's the Emmitsburg Road, the Tawny Town Road that goes right behind Little Round Top, and the Baltimore Pike, which is the main Union supply line uh, that goes right by Culp's Hill. Well, remember on the second day, the Confederates attack across the Emmitsburg Road, and when the day is over... The Emmitsburg Road is no longer in Union hands. Oh, yeah. And as he said, Kevin said, he said, if you have a 100,000-man army and hundreds of cannons and thousands of wagons, and you got to get out of town on just one road, meaning you only have one supply line, you're going to get bottlenecked. Mm. I always say to people, have you ever been down to Washington, D.C. on the Beltway at 5 o'clock on a Friday afternoon? Mm. Gridlock. 
And so and that's a four lane road. That's four lane road. <laughs> um, so if Little Round Top Falls, you're only a few hundred yards from the Tawny Tent Road, which is a, a critical Union supply line. Right. You don't have to capture it. All you have to do is threaten it, and Meade's got to go. Uh, and for anybody who's <laughs> never actually, you know, you can't see too well from the top of, of Little Round Top to the east. It's all wooded. But what I suggest is go down Sykes Avenue to the stop sign at the Wheatfield Road. Look to the right. You'll see a stop sign by that little ice cream place. That's yeah. the Tawny Town Road. What would you guys say that is? 300 yards, maybe? Maybe. Fonts, I just read this today. Fonts says it's 500 yards from where Vincent's left was, which from is where Vincent's close enough. left was, yeah. which is 20th Main. 20th Main, right, which is close enough. But I that's, mean, it's, that's, it's, I think it's the Tawny Road kind of veers away a little bit right. as it goes down. To but even so, 500 yards, that's right. the distance of Devil's Den, the little round top. <laughs> so your point, and I'm saying amen, amen, and amen, that it's the, the, it protects the road. Yeah. Just not just Little Round Top and Big Round Top, but also the Cemetery Ridge line is protecting right. that road. Just like Culps Hill. Exactly. And Rock Creek, if you can anchor on that, the is Pike. protecting the Baltimore Pike. Yep. And you have to have both, not just one. I think if they sever one, the South wins the battle. Now, that's a pretty extreme thing to say, but I, th I think so. Oh, I think so too because Meade would have evacuated. All right. He already has a pre prepared position at Pipe Creek. So that's going to make it easier for him if he's under any kind of pressure at all to say, we're out of here. Right. Now, now, having said that, amen, amen, amen. Remember, I said that. I agree with you that Little Round Top is essential to anchor your line on. Of the three hills that comprise the fish hook, Culp's, Cemetery, Little Round Top. In my opinion, the most important of those three hills is the Cemetery Hill. I agree with you. Okay. Those two supply but, lines come together. Right. But at, just like Culp's Hill will command Cemetery Hill, you cannot hold Cemetery Hill if the Confederates have Culp's Hill. Similarly, I don't think you can hold it if the Confederates have Little Round Top. Okay. So it's kind of a, a trio set. They have to all hold or fall together. But none of this would have mattered anyway because... If they were able to get Little Round Top, the sixth core is still coming up, and they would have slammed uh, into that's their the rear. other question. And the twelfth yeah. core is right behind them. Yeah, that, okay. see that—that's I have this debate all the time. Little Round Top to me is not terribly important, just from a tactical standpoint. The only thing it's really good for is to break up an attack the way it did—an attack that is moving across your front to the west of the hill mm, because mm. you turn to the north and. Oh, it's such a great artillery platform. You can put two guns, maybe, facing north off of that hill. Facing north, right. Yeah, right. I, the same facing south, the, the, and you can't do anything with artillery to the east. Right. The Union only had six, I think it was six guns yeah. up there. Yeah. Hazel yeah, had four written. and you've Gibbs had two. Hazel's battery up top, and then you've got Gibbs kind of on the north right. slope. Uh, but, again, it's not a terribly great position for the Confederates, I think most people look at it just from a Union standpoint, looking at what actually happened, how it played out. This is the most important hill on the battlefield. I don't think that's the case. And Lee kind of Lee kind of supports that to a point because his battle plan isn't to take Little Round Top. I think the only thing he really wants to know from Captain Johnson is if there's somebody up there that can take them in the flank as they're going past it. And Captain Johnson says no. no. So he says, right. all right, go do it. Right. That's just me. I'm sorry. So I'm then be no, I was, now. when Johnston right. says nobody's up there, he's answering the question, nobody's up there who could take us in the flank for Signal that, Corps that's officers what, That's how like I've that. always interpreted that. Lee's not worried about the position itself because it doesn't really do anything for him trying to attack the rest of the federal line. It's all about who is going to be on my right that can crush me when I'm going north. See, that's the interesting thing about language. You know, is anybody up there? No. It's like uh, before the little bighorn, uh, General Terry says to Custer, he says, uh, don't be greedy, wait for us. And Custer just says, no, I won't. Well, what the hell is he saying? No, I won't to. I won't be greedy or I won't wait for you. <laughs> but that's the way language goes, you know? So I guess it's kind of the same idea. Well, that's interesting. Interesting stuff. What was the question? What, Waylon? <laughs> You don't have to hold the, it, just speak. The only way artillery works on Little Round Top is in the defense of the Federals, because you turn those guns, what are you pointing at? Mm -hmm. Trees. There's nothing for guns to do when you turn them. 
you it's might have trees. been able to get one or two, like like yeah. Eric said, pointing north. But maybe, not, yeah. But not not but a whole lot. It's not a Gibraltar like right. people want to make it out to be. Well, now it's not, but what did it know, look if, like if then? The Confederates take it, then the rest of the federal line to the north of them is untenable because there's no, you know, they've, they've got all of their batteries on little rounds. No, you can get like one battery up yeah. there and realistically only facing to the west. Yeah, and how much damage would it do? Not that much. Like how much damage did Rittenhouse's battery look, do to Look at how many Kemper's guns they brigade. used the following day right. compared to how much damage it actually did right, and how well right, that attack right. worked out. Exactly. Um, I thought I heard you just say, what did it look like then? Yeah. Uh, here's a quote from one Georgian, I think... I didn't write down the source on this. Is like a thirty-year-old card. It's page four hundred nine. It might have been Fox. Okay, but one George. It might be um, Coddington too. One Georgian said it was the strongest natural position he had ever seen. EPL okay. EP about Little Round Top. The strength of Little Round Top on defense. EP Alexander. I hope I wrote this right. And when I got to take in all the topography, I was very much disappointed. It was not the enemy's main line that had been broken. Okay, that's. I guess he's talking about Sickles' position, sorry. This was after smashing Sickles. There was a high ridge, very strong position where they were reinforced and stood repulsing our infantry line. And that was probably a description of the cemetery ridge. Okay. All right, uh, let's move on here to uh, Chaplain Cox. He says, hello, Matt. My question concerns the development of Little Round Top postbellum. I understand there was an attempt to place a large museum on top of Little Round Top by General Crawford. Is this true? And what would... <laughs> Come on over, Eric. And what could possibly be his motive for such a monstrosity? And my second question is, what is the status of the National Park study to rehabilitate little round top let's still eric you want to jump on that because you all right so in 1887 i believe it is or 88 pennsylvania puts out that they are going to fund the building of monuments for pennsylvania regiments i think this is 1887 they were initially supposed to dedicate them in 88 and then the guy who was in charge of planning it died so they pushed it to the next year so uh, Crawford goes to the Pennsylvania Reserves Association, their veterans organization, and says, we should pool all of our money together, this $1,200 per regiment together, and go in on one memorial hall. And it's going to be a museum for the Pennsylvania Reserve Division through the entire war. So wait, so just to, just to clarify something, you said $1,200 per regiment. Per regiment. Was 12 or 15? Oh, it might be 15. Either way, the state was going to give each regiment yeah, 12 or dollars for towards a, a regiment. Correct. Okay, so that now they're all saying, let's just all put our money together for one Correct. big, huge museum. Yeah. Um, to, to make this happen, Crawford actually buys property in Plum Run Valley, uh, right about where the Crawford Monument is now. Uh, he buys, I think it's five acres right there. So it's in a swamp, and if you've ever seen Monty Python, the dude talks about building his castle in the middle of a swamp, and it sank into the swamp. I think that would have happened, too. But uh, Crawford buys this property. He convinces all the regimental associations from the Pennsylvania Reserves to throw their money together, and they approach the state to do this. Uh, the state takes some time to deliberate, uh, and there's actually, you can read it, uh, there is a judgment from the attorney general's office in 1889 uh, that says, no, what will happen is, well, one, your entire division wasn't here because they were missing a brigade. Uh, there was a brigade left in the defenses of Washington. Um, so it won't keep in the spirit of the legislation. Okay. Uh, the other thing is, if you do that, we're going to give you the same amount of money that we would for a regiment because it's one oh, single organization. This is so slippery yeah. people, these lawyers. <laughs> Which is also part of the reason why the Pennsylvania Reserve Monuments are not erected and dedicated in 1889 with the rest of the PA monuments. They're done in 1890 okay. because this... this uh, decision doesn't come out until like two months before pennsylvania day and by then it's way too late to get a monument designed cut and put up in time for dedication so then really the money that the state was giving wasn't 
per regimen. It was per monument. It was basically, yeah, more or less. I mean, it's um, like a technical, it's the same thing. Because but you, each battery not. gets the same amount of money, too. Right. And a battery's essentially one company. Right. Uh, but they're getting the same amount of money as a regiment does. Huh. Uh, but it's not supposed to go on top of Little Round Top. It's supposed to be down in the bottom of Plum Run Valley, basically at the intersection of the Wheatfield Road and Crawford Avenue now. And if you dig hard enough on the internet, you can find a, a drawing of the proposed hall. Uh, and I've got that on my phone. I'll show you guys uh, when we're done here. But it's an impressive yeah. structure. You showed me before. It's pretty Yeah, uh, it, it's If anybody's familiar with Pittsburgh, you've got Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Hall in Oakland. It looks like it's of comparable size to that. And that place covers basically half a city block. Can you imagine that down there? Or something, or a smaller version of that. I mean, that's crazy. And would the park today be supporting it because it was built by the veterans? So I'm They'd glad it didn't happen. Be. They'd have yeah. to. Yeah, I'm glad it's it didn't a happen. swampy ground. Yeah, that's not How the best ground. Yeah, that's well, that's like I say, the dude in Monty Python. That's where we do our kayak tours when we can't do the bike tours. The <laughs> <laughs> During the rainy season. Yeah. Well, so the the second part of the question was about the. Uh, 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 rehabilitation on top of Little Round Top. Now, I don't know what the latest is with that, but I've seen the plans. Someone sent them to me. I, 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 I hesitate to give my opinion because you're not, you know, you know how it is, but I, I, I think it would be a horrible thing if they did it. I, I looked at it probably about a year ago, so it, the details aren't, I couldn't find it. I was looking it up to answer this question, but I couldn't find, I don't remember who sent it to me, but um, I, I don't know what the, does anybody know, Jim, do you know, Bob, have you heard what the latest on this is? Have you heard anything recently, Bob? Um, I have not, I don't know any updates about this at all, and right. I'm not going to make any comments about don't, the advisability no. or inadvisability of it, because um, I just don't know enough about it. All I know is that the Park Service is well intended even sometimes when they might not make what i consider to be the best decision oh i'm not calling their intentions yeah i know, I know I'm, I'm just saying i'm just saying that i hope it was just a proposal that they looked at and said you've got to be kidding uh, that's what i'm hoping i don't know if they did or not well now sometime back matt i did hear that they were looking at the possibility yeah like, like you said proposal not necessarily a decision to build boardwalks so right that, because they're worried little what the park, one of the park superintendents said years ago was we're lo loving Little Round Top to death. Mm -hmm. And he's right. It's so popular. So many cars, so many people up there. It's eroding. Mm -hmm. um, so they, one of the things I heard that I think has been rejected is the building of boardwalks. The idea is that you would be standing up there, but you wouldn't actually be touching the, the ground. ground. Okay, more recently what I've heard is if you go to Little Round Top today, you will notice as you come up Sykes Avenue from the south and you pass Vincent's Brigade marker on the left, you'll see these man-made paths, dirt paths that people have created mm. because they're leaving the paved road and they're mm. going up. And when you get to the 44th New York, it's crumbling. It's yes. crumbling. The, the, the pavement is crumbling yes. up there because people are stepping on or jumping off yep. of it. So the park wants to get rid of that. They even put little ribbons to show where all recently where all those paths were. So my understanding now is they want to get rid of that. They want to rehabilitate that, get rid of those man-made paths and put in permanent paths with some type of all-weather surface. That's my understanding. Okay. okay. That makes sense. Which makes a lot of sense. That does, But yeah. the problem is, and I think Bob didn't say it, but he kind of alluded to it, and we, is they don't communicate with us real well, do they, Bob? I mean, I haven't been no around <laughs> for, because of coronavirus, I haven't been around the visitor center a lot, but they do send us some emails. Yeah. But I, that's always been one of my criticisms of the park, is they don't always inform the guides of what's going on. Right. They have these meetings that people can go to periodically. We don't always attend, but... Uh, you know, like tree removal. They're not currently doing it. Right. But they did historic tree removal. And we meet with the park a couple times a year, and they wouldn't necessarily tell us anything about that. Mm -hmm. So you're given a tour, you come around a corner, say it over at Culp's Hill, and all of a sudden, tree all these trees on. were for 20 years that you gave tours, there's no trees there anymore. And you're like, oh my gosh. And your visitors are like, what's the matter? <laughs> and you're like, they took the trees out. And you feel like an idiot because you didn't, you didn't know. know yeah. You're seeing it just to the first time the way they are. And you wish somebody give us a heads up. Yeah. Hey, next week. <laughs> but see, or you could just learn to not be surprised anymore. That's what I've had to do. But <laughs> to, to, to be fair to the park, and not, yeah. not that you're We're not, not being picking fair. You are park. being fair. Yeah. But uh, this is the ideas. year, very unusual year yes. since uh, sure. Bill rubbed Patrick O'Rourke's nose. And <laughs> COVID has canceled our... Lives. Twice yearly meeting with the park personnel where we can ask questions like this. 
because of COVID. We couldn't all be in that that meeting this year. Yeah, good which point. were meetings in person, like yeah, in they were meetings in person. Now we're doing it on Zoom, right? And so, but but this year's spring meeting was all full of how are we going to conduct any kind of business, any kind of tours with COVID, right? Remember, and, and that meeting was dominated by COVID kind of concerns. Well, so, I'm going back years, Bob. Because oh, yeah. there's been a moratorium on tree removal for all, several all years. All I'm now. saying is that I am, for one, I can just speak for myself. I am more in the dark about this or any other park intention, but. I think it's mostly because of that meeting, because I usually get informed at that meeting about a lot of things. I used to go to those meetings all the time because I wanted to know about things like that. I wanted to know, you guys are going to be taking out trees at McPherson Woods, and, and I'd like to know when. So I'm not, I'm prepared. And th- th- my, my criticism would just be, and I think it's gotten better over the last years, but I just wish the Park Service would would let us know a little bit. But I was thinking about this today, and I thought about it. I said, you know who's doing that? You know who's doing the tree removal? It's maintenance. They don't have anything to do with the guides. They're a whole different department. Yeah, sure. If there's any department that would be talking to the guides, it'd be interpretation. And I, I don't know, maybe they're having the same problem. Maybe, maybe maintenance doesn't say, hey, on Wednesday, we're going to be taking trees down at McPherson's Woods. That's all I'm saying. I just, I'd, I'd like to know that so that you're well, prepared and, when you drive around the corner. In fairness to them, they haven't had a, a permanent superintendent for a while. That's true. And so now we have one. So That's true. Let's... You We've know, had a series of temporary things, superintendents. Exactly yeah, right. So let's hope that that improves things. And uh, I hear good things about him. So I think yeah. I think that will. I well, think, I bring that up because I'm sorry, uh, Eric. I just I just bring that up because the question is there. What can you guys tell us about uh, the situation at Little Round Top? And, and Bob and I are looking at each other. We're going. I haven't heard anything. Uh, I don't know. How long? <laughs> that, that's why I brought that up. I'm sorry. Yeah, thank I, you. I think as visitors. Right. Stewardship is part of your responsibility to the park that Amen. you're visiting. So if you don't want to see any kind of I proposed or otherwise crazy implementation of boardwalks, skywalks, whatever, stay on the path. Right. Stop yeah. jumping it's not around that hard. the place. Just yeah. walk on the paved path. Pave and, st- and keep your kids off the boulders. Amen. Well, I will say this. <laughs> Stop uh, rubbing over those venomous snows. snakes and poison snakes. sumac and oh, poison yeah. ivy off those baths. <laughs> they did, Killer spiders. They did some drilling on the east side of Sykes Avenue by the parked cars on the right side of the road. They cleared woods out and they did drillings, I guess, to see how deep the stone is and what type. Mm. Uh, they did tell us they were doing that too. And they did, I'll give them credit Just for that. Just recently, like within the last year. For talking what? About. I'm talking within the last few months. Yeah, okay. Looks like right. within since the spring. Okay. And if you go up there, you see what I'm talking about, where they've mowed it. And we did get some emails about that they were boring, boring holes. Well, why else would they be doing that? Mm. Except that I think they're looking at possibly making yeah. that a pull off or a pavement, yeah. a, a parking area. <sighs> we'll see. Um, bicycles, National Park, if you're listening, bicycles only and walkers <laughs> only allowed on the back. Yeah, but, what, but, but then you <laughs> run into the ADA problems, Bob, and... Right? I don't, don't want to walk the whole battlefield, Bob. Bike it. I don't want to bike, <laughs> bike it. it. I like driving Feel around. But, but then the people Feel. that can't bike it or walk it, have a, then they can't have access to it. How well, do you do you that? You can make you have some trams wow. for the ADA what, what about uh What about, like, uh, what are those things called? Like a cable car. We did the trolley thing once before. We'll have Everybody a cable hated car. It. That was before the advent of the automobile. But <laughs> the bicycles were here before the automobile. That's true. Bicycles have always been around. I don't know. I, I, I think the reason it, it just makes me cringe, the thought of doing something. I understand, like, it is eroding bad. And you can see all those paved walkways up there. You just look at the edge of it, and it's a good 18 inches to three feet ab- ab- above the dirt. And, and that's from people just walking right off them and doing whatever. Plus, it rains and all this other stuff. So, I, we absolutely do have a problem up there. The, the bigger sin to me the thing that breaks my heart I should say would be the thought of there being structures up there that would change the view from below I don't think they're going to do that I hope not I don't see that happening either but how about this for an idea go ahead I like a two deck parking garage (laughs) on the east side I'm not kidding okay those trees aren't that historic and okay. even where you could put it at the summit of the hill, that may block some tree area. Sure. But you can still see trees on the side of it. And then at the second level of the garage, you could have bus parking. You build a bridge right over Sykes Avenue to come over. 
So now you take all the kids in the buses, you mm. put them, you veer off to the right of Sykes Avenue, and you have them walk over the bridge over. You're not, they're not in the road anymore. Okay. I'm thinking about the spring. We have yeah, all yeah. the eighth grade yeah, buses. Yeah. So you could use that as an expanded parking area on the right, and then keep people out of the roads by maybe accessing with a bridge. Okay. That's just the thought I had. I. What do you think? The thing for me that the reason why it bothers me so much is because when they years ago started clearing the trees. I love that. Yeah. I love that because now I can see what they saw. I can understand. It's easier to show people and interpret it. And, and you understand now when, when, you know, before they clear the trees in front of devil's den down in the triangular field in that area and you'd, you know, take a tour and they'd talk about the Confederates coming from down there. I'm like, how the hell did they get through the woods? Yeah. But there were no woods. Right. <laughs> so we, we now you to- could see it. We talked about earlier, Law's Brigade yeah. up on uh, uh, Pitch, w- Woods Wouldn't have been Rivers. able to they see that. They can see Devil's Den. Right. And when I first started guiding before they um, took those trees out, I'd be driving along that road near the picnic area on the south end of the battlefield, South Confederate Avenue. I'd say, well, this is how far the Confederates came to make their attack. They launched their attack from down here. Visitor asked, well, why'd they come all the way down here? I'd say, well, trust me. They, they wanted to attack the end of the Union line at Devil's Den, and Devil's Den is on the other side of these trees. I'd point down the hill to the left. <laughs> I don't have to say trust right. me anymore. <laughs> I can sit up on that ridge and I can point down there, show them Devil's Den, and now they understand it. It's great. And I have to give credit to, to the superintendent at the time, um, who takes a lot of criticism. Latcher. Uh, Latcher. Yeah. Because he said something, I'll never forget. He, he pointed to the top of one of our interpretive markers, and it says Gettysburg National Military Park. Mm-hmm. And he pointed that word military. He says, we're not just a national park. We're a national military park. So our main function isn't throwing frisbees and picnicking. It's interpreting the deeds of what happened here. And, and the best way to do that is what you said, Matt. Being able to see it the way the soldiers yeah. did because it makes more sense. And, and I, I was 100% with him when I heard him say that. I was like, absolutely. And I was, I'll admit it, I was critical of the man for other things. But uh, the one thing I loved about the guy was that he, he knew what he was the head of. And it was a military park. And the military don't care about your feelings. Because <laughs> people were all upset. I remember when they started cutting the trees. They go, "Oh, I love to rollerblade through those trees, or I love to jog there with my dog." And it's like, well, too bad. It's not a recreational park. So, I don't know. We'll see. So, I hope that answers your question in some way. We we don't know. Um, but again, like Eric kind of alluded to before, uh, stewardship, custodianship, whatever you want to call it, it's it's all of our park, and um, we all, you know could do our parts take care of it we could also all contact the park service and ask these questions ourselves well i don't know who to call someone someone over there just give them a call and and see so what have it's we learned park. stay on the trails clean up your trash right and your doggy bags oh we find those all the time and visit the savior of little round top and that's crawford's <laughs> monument <laughs> that nobody ever <laughs> You know, those doggy bags, anybody listening to this that's local and you go for a walk over there, we're on to you. We've been cleaning up your poop bags since the spring, and it's really annoying. And, and, and you know what? Hiding it behind a tree on the, on the opposite side of the road isn't hiding it because people get out and walk, and that's when we find them. And also, dropping it. When you're getting in your car, as if you didn't notice it, as you close the door, I saw a guy do that once and then drive off. You oh. saw me do that? <laughs> <laughs> Just no. Kidding. Well, you remember, you yelled at a guy for pooping. <laughs> not for pooping, for not picking up his dog. Oh, poop. that's right. Yeah, yeah it was dog poop. <laughs> I didn't yell. I pointed it out. <laughs> okay. Two more questions. And then we're done. Jamie Clifton says, I thought I've heard that Chamberlain ordered Company B to the left to protect against a flank attack. But in Trudeau's book, Trudeau says that that the company was sent forward up Big Round Top. And upon hearing the Texas and Arkansas attacks on Vincent's right, Captain uh, Morrill decided to fall back to the stone wall some 400 feet to the east of the 20th main position. Which is it? It He was in Arkansas. So he was in Alabama. uh, uh, Alabama, yeah. Um, so, in other words, did Chamberlain order them to the left to protect against the flank, or did he send them up as skirmishers and they fell back to the I'll left? I'll be anxious to hear what Eric has to say, being a, a reenactor, but one thing I do know is that uh, before an attack, you always sent a company or a tenth of your regiment forward in front of you mm-hmm. to find the enemy, draw their fire, get an idea of where they are, how big they are, and Develop how close they them. are. 
So it doesn't really make any sense. It would be kind of unconventional to send him off to the left to protect the flank, especially just a company. But it was typical Civil War tactics to send a company straight ahead of you, mm-hmm. uh, a skirmish line. So th- I believe that. Yeah. I think I've heard he, that. He's sending him, um, he is sending him more towards the enemy, maybe a little bit more to the left of, of the 20th Main's line. Yeah, the way it's... But they are climbing I went, Big Round Top yeah. when they hear this roar of musketry okay. to their rear. And they, this would be Captain Walter Morrill, fall back to that rock wall. Because uh, in because uh, I went and found it in Trudeau last night, and the, he says that it was the northeast slope of Big Round Big Top Round that Top. they went Correct. up. So Which that would have been... Right. Yeah. Okay. And that's what you want to do. If you are at the left flank of the entire Union Army, you have to have eyes out there in case there's a flanking maneuver. Mm-hmm. And so that's why Morrill is going out there. Okay. But once contact is made, they're going to fall back. And then... The sharpshooters, about a dozen sharpshooters that had been out there. Company A, second U.S. I'm right? not sure which which one it was, is. but they had fallen back to there too. Right. So those were the guys that the 15th Alabama was fighting all the way back to and up and over. 15th big round top. Yeah. What two did I their, say? Two, 50th. I two did of their not companies. say 50th. I I don't know. Last <laughs> week I said that I don't cuss and that you you played it back and I well, did. So okay, maybe. <laughs> tomorrow you play it back to me whether you said 50th or 15th. Maybe I, don't I care. said 50th. I don't know. But yeah, those those four companies of U.S. sharpshooters, two of them, as they were as they hit near the summit of Big Round Top, two went around the south side. Two companies went around the north side of Big Round Top. All right. And and one company of the 15th Alabama Company A, A yeah. is going to go around to the south side and take themselves out of the fight, they're heading towards the Tawny Town Road. There was some wagons down there. Right, they were they trying saw. to get the wagons, yeah. All right. and But they didn't get them. No. They just hunkered down behind a wall because I think they saw Company B and... I'm not sure exactly right? what happened to them and why, but they okay. did Jim, you had something you wanted to say there? Oh, just a thought. Uh, I've always just thought that, that Company B, Captain Morrill... Um, you know, made the contact as they were supposed to and start falling back. Never been in those thick woods before. Yeah. And just don't make contact. Don't make the main body that they veer off and then, you know, like we're isolated and they find the walls. <laughs> Get behind the wall. And basically, you know, hanging out behind the wall until Chamberlain okay. makes the bayonet charge. And then all of a sudden, they're in a whole different situation. Now right. they've got the Confederates in their flank. They can fire into them. Now they're the aggressors. They're right. the, the offensive. I, I don't know that, but I've always imagined that. I always imagined they, that in that thick woods they'd never been in before, they just got disoriented, started to fall back, but just slightly missed the main body. Yeah, because um, I, I don't recall reading that they actually did make any contact with the 15th Alabama, right? They they just heard the fighting over on the right and then you said, what you're saying makes sense. It's like, well, okay, there's something going on over there. We can't see it. We're yeah. going up a wooded hill. Let's go to that wall over there. Yeah, they fall back, but they don't make necessary contact with the main body. They're a little bit to the left of the 20th main. And so they fall back into the trees. They're on their own. There's a stone wall. They get behind it and they're just sitting it out mm-hmm. until all of a sudden they can see. Because when you're at that wall, you can walk down there. There's a marker down there, especially in the wintertime when the leaves are down. You could see what was happening with the bayonet charge. You, you, you could realize now the Confederates are on the run, and you can deliver a flank fire. Okay. Yeah, this is all Fonce has to say about this. Um, Morrill and Company B were sent out to screen the 20th front and left. Morrill and his men were climbing Round Top's north slope when firing broke out to the company's right and rear. Mm. Morrill shifted his line left to avoid any Confederates that might have gotten in his rear and then pulled his company back to the saddle. Mm. Instead of rejoining the main line there, he placed his company behind a stone wall and on it. Okay. All right, uh, Matt McClanahan says, Grandson of your favorite golden girl here. In the early 1900s, William Oates and Joshua Chamberlain exchanged a series of letters regarding a proposed monument of the 15th Alabama on Little Round Top. We kind of touched on this before, didn't we? But we'll go anyway. Um, blah, 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 blah. Colonel Oates lost his brother on July 2nd and contended that his brother died atop a large stone behind the 20th Maine's lines. Colonel Chamberlain refuted Colonel Oates' contentions, but a southern man don't need him around anyhow. <laughs> Settle this one once and for all. <laughs> Who was right? Assuming the 15th Alabama gets a monument, where should it go? They're not going to get a monument. In this day and age of taking down Confederate mm-hmm. monuments, where nobody's putting up a monument mm-hmm. to the 15th Alabama. <laughs> but good try, Matt McClanahan. Go ahead, Jim. I was just going to say, the window for that is passed. Yeah. 
But uh, I think we I think we talked. We, about we did that. touch. Okay, okay, Matt, we're gonna have you uh, rewind and uh, re-listen to the question before that uh, dealt with that subject, Bob. If we're gonna say anything about the 15th Alabama, let's talk about Sergeant O'Connor. Okay, Company K, maybe who's got a guy named Nelson because he keeps running away <laughs> um, by the scruff of the neck. <laughs> and uh, uh, he's been told the sergeant has to keep this guy from running away during the fight. <laughs> and he's holding him up. And uh, he, the guy gets hit and dies. And he just drops him and says, well, he's not going anywhere now. <laughs> oh, Something like that. That's a paraphrase. But Thanks. So let's include That's, the monument of that. Yeah. Holding up a 15th right. Alabama Scalawagger, or uh, that's not the word, skedaddler. Uh, shirker. shirker. Shirker, there, there we go. Yeah. Uh, all right, well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for uh, <laughs> sitting uh, and enduring this with us. Um, <laughs> I think you got a few laughs out of today's show, right? I mean, we were in a good mood. Little Tommy's Pizza always uh, puts us in a good mood, and uh, as well as a rainstorm. We'd like to thank uh, Keddie Spike Tours for letting us use their fine facilities. And uh, thank you, Jim, for coming in. Thank you, Eric, for sitting in. Thank you, Bob, for being Bob, as always. Bob wore his uniform here, by the way, ladies and gentlemen. That's because I had a tour today. Yeah. Oh, I thought that was just for us. I thought you went home after your tour. I, I did go home, but I didn't change. Don't ever change, Bob. All right, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> thank you very much for listening. And don't forget, if you want to submit questions, <laughs> if you want to submit questions to uh, a future Ask Gettysburg guide, you got to be a second lieutenant over on patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. It supports the show. It buys guests like Jim a uh, dinner when they come here. Um, although we missed a couple, though. No, we didn't do dinner the last couple times, but we're going to get back into doing that anyway. Thank you all for listening. We'll talk to you later. Thanks all. Bye.